Hello and welcome to episode 480. Not 300. 300 is the number we've heard all day, but it's not 300. 480 of Fergo on the Freak. I'm the bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRP. And joining me as always is the glorious League Freak. You can also find me on Twitter at League Freak. How you going, mate? I'm going very well, Andrew. How are you? 300. Yeah, it's, well, it's been a special day, hasn't it? The whole hour and a half leading into that game today between mm-hmm. Jared Croker and whatever team he's playing against was about 300 games. I have not seen that much of a wank fest about a player reaching 300 games ever. And there's been 47 other players. You know what I was thinking? Because I didn't watch the lead in. I, I, I caught, like, I turned it on about five minutes before the kickoff. And uh, and I saw that they were already, like, fucking juicy about him. And so I went and made a coffee. Hang on. Um, does, that, does that mean you missed the interview with his parents? Are you fucking serious? Oh, mate. His old man had a story that would have had you in tears. Really? What was it about? And you and only you. Why? What was it about? They said to him, yeah, so what's your greatest memory mm. of, you know, some great act that that Jared's done on the football field in those uh, 299 games so far? Mm-hmm. Was it a try? Was it a goal? Was it a win? You know, what was it? He says, no, nah, it was none of that. It was a tackle. <laughs> what the fuck was it the tackle he made in his career <laughs> and he said it was some game um i can't remember who it was between i it's, think it was hmm. i think it was canberra and brisbane when israel Folau was playing for brisbane and the raiders were up by two points or four points or something according to his story and um Folau was uh, made a run down the sideline and Croker tackled him and took him into touch about a metre or two before the corner and then the, the game went as the match-winning tackle in the corner and saved the day. That's some sad Canberra Raiders shit, isn't it? <laughs> That's... <laughs> the first thing I thought was, I, kind of, I don't know if that ever happened, but I've, I need to tell Freaky this story. you will love it. That's fucking fantastic. <laughs> you know, I always think of when I was watching it and you see him run through the banner, and I thought that banner fucking hits harder than he does in defence. And I was thinking, is there a less accomplished 300 gamer in the NRL's history? The only one that will come to mind will be mm-hmm. um, John Morris. Yeah, John, he played country. He played for country. Yeah, okay. And I guess I guess Crocker played for country, wouldn't he? Yes, he did. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess you I guess you could line them both up. Yeah, because what else have we got here. Um, because most people like it's it's three hundred currently right now. No, eventually it's become going to become four hundred. Will be that standard. Um, but three hundred is still a lot of games. And what I was thinking is normally when you play 300 games, you've accomplished a lot. There, there's a reason why not many people did it. And I was thinking, like, you can't point to, like, they kept on going about, and, and first of all, let me say, it's much more important to be a nice person than it is to be a great footballer. But when you hit 300 games and they keep saying he's a good bloke, he's a real good bloke, they don't say... <laughs> A lot of origins, a lot of tests, premierships. They say, no, he's a good bloke. It's like, there's something in there. Yeah. I'm um, not saying it's, it's that, bad to be a, a good bloke, too. but it's, you know what I mean? I was thinking, well, what, do you, what would you point to over his 300 games? Yeah, look, I would say that he's a good off-the-field leader. Is he? And, and it feels like, well, yeah, because, you know, he doesn't lead players astray, does he? He's, he's He lives a good, clean life, and he's been incident-free with, mm-hmm. dra- you know, off-field drama his whole mm-hmm. career. True. That, that's something to his, um, to him as a human. That That's a genuinely good thing. But it also sounds like you're trying to find something good to say about someone when you can't say something good about the way they play the game of football, which is the main reason why they're hired. Yeah, kind of like, you know, say something good about Moses and Bite. It's basically the same conversation. Yeah, it's like, well, he fucking won't go home. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's still here. Doesn't matter what people say, he's still here. You got to give him here. that. 
Um, like I'm even Ricky to... Stewart was like, I told him to go home three years ago. He's fucker's still here. Okay, other other three hundred game players, yeah, who didn't really have any sort of um, major rep careers. Mm-hmm. John Sutton. Well, see, I think John Sutton is a completely different level to Crocker. I I think that I think Sutton he, he probably should have played for New South Wales. I agree. I maybe a little bit unlucky. I agree. And, and I mean, three hundred games for the Bunnies as a one club player is unbelievable. Yeah. Um. So I I I personally would put him on a completely different level. So yeah, one game for the Prime Minister thirteen, which is pretty <laughs> close, and two games for City. Um. Aiden Tolman. Aiden Tolman. Uh, he had three games for country, and that was it. Three hundred seventeen NRL games. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. And the other one was Mitch Orbison. He played yeah. two games for country. Yeah, that's another one, yeah. But out they're of, the only ones who didn't play Origin. They didn't play for Australia. Okay, out of those players that, that didn't play Origin or for Australia, um, or, or New Zealand, I guess, we'd also have to say. Um, oh, and obviously John Morris is on that list as well, but yes. Yeah, yeah. Which, where would you rate Crocker? Um, lower than all of them. Yes, same here. Yeah, I, I'd take Aiden Tolman over him. I think I'll say this: Croker at his peak, and that was probably 2015, 2016, mm-hmm. right? Um, he was a solid enough finisher, very good goal kicker, mm-hmm. and he has always had a pretty good um, passing game. So a lot of his wingers would score points. He wouldn't. He wouldn't just hog the ball and score for himself. That's for me. That's the basically the the majority of the stuff that he does. That's of uh, NRL level. Um, being a centre, you need to be very good defensively. Mm-hmm. And you know, you're not always expected to make big one-on-one hits. You are expected to at least stick to a tackle. Because you're going to have a winger outside, you can come in if you if you if the centre stopped the play, mm. or your second rower on your on your inside is going to come in and help affect the tackle. You're going to have cover defence coming across to help cover if the ball gets switched back. So you need to be able to make the tackle and stick to it, because you're at least slowing the play down. You're giving your defence a chance to catch up and make decisions and get back on top. Um, and we did see a try tonight that was scored where he did not get a hand on the player. Yeah, and and play was drifting, right. Yeah, so he was sliding with the play, and they still got around him, and that's that's a problem. Like that's yeah. I know you talk about him not being a great tackler, and for me, that's a different a different discussion. This one was about him not being fast enough laterally, and that's happened a lot in his career. Yeah, like and- he's, he's relied on trying to keep up with them as he slides and hope that. They, the attack pushes the winger out of the play so that his winger can come in and help him make the tackle. Yeah, he can't he can't physically shut a person down. He and he can't read a defense to he can't read make a defensive read to save his life. Um, like he's he's the worst defender I've ever seen in my life. Um, but you know he did three hundred games, and it was good, good luck to him. It's probably the biggest moment in Canberra Rugby League since nineteen ninety four. Yeah, twenty one thousand there today. Yeah, yeah, that's that insane. Good. Yeah, you know what? There was one thing that they, the club did, which I thought was absolutely genius. Mm-hmm. Right in the whole week, because at the end of every game, Croker would give away his headgear mm-hmm. to a kid in the ground. Mm-hmm. And for his whole career, he's been giving away the Segi, which meant there was 299 sets of headwear out there, mm-hmm. headgear out there, that fans had. Mm-hmm. So they said, if you ever got a, a headgear from Jared Croker, mm-hmm. come to the game. And I think they may have even let him in, like free charge. Yeah. So they wanted to have everyone with their headgear that were there. I thought that was actually a genius idea. Yeah, that was great. That was great. Um, the atmosphere was pretty damn good. It was. Um, and – Brief recap of the game. It was genuinely a game of two halves. Canberra dominated the first half in attack and defence, yeah. but they could not get points on the board. 
No. And that was the difference. In the second half, even when the Warriors were down a player, well, that was actually in the end of the first half. That was the turning point. They they lost that, um, I think it was Barnett to a sin bin. I'm still mm-hmm. not convinced on what happened there. Um, but they lost him to the sin bin, and that seemed to be the turning point because Canberra did not score any points in there. The Warriors had to knuckle down to stay competitive, and they scored a try near the end of that 10-minute period. And then they, then the Raiders had to kick a penalty goal to stay in front of half time. But then the Warriors scored 30 points to six in the second half after that. Smashed him, yeah. Whitewash. It really was, and it, it like it was just such a Canberra event, you know, big celebrations and stuff, and then get whipped. Um, and they the thing about the Warriors, they just went up the middle. The, yeah. the, the turnaround that they've had is amazing. We we've talked about it a little bit how they made massive personnel changes, and obviously uh, Andrew Webster coming in as the coach has been fantastic. He's already the coach of the year. And can I say? Mm-hmm. Former West Tigers assistant coach. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. We let that one go. Did he go? I guess he went from the West Tigers. I feel like he went over to England for a bit and then come back and was a, a, a low grade coach for the Panthers. Ended up being an assistant coach under Ivan Cleary. Uh, I'm pretty sure who... that's, that, that's how it went. Um, no, I don't think he went to England. I thought he went to England. No. Oh, certainly, Dad. No, he in 2020, he went to Penrith. Yeah. To replace Trent Barrett. That was after he'd been at the West Tigers for two... He had two years at the Warriors, and then I think two years at the Tigers as assistant, then went to Penrith for two years. Did he? Did he play over in England at the end of his career? Oh, I don't know if he actually. I feel like he did. He, he was a player. He he played, but yeah. he didn't. I don't think he played any senior football. Um, he played SG ball and Jersey flag in Sydney in the nineties for Balmain and oh god, I'm going to guess here. It's either the Bulldogs or Parramatta. It was one of those two teams. Um, and then, he, geez, it might have been the Bulldogs. Because I'm pretty sure I saw him playing for Rita, Rita, Rita Eastwood. Um, and then, yeah, I, he might have he might have gone to English rugby or something like that. You know, one of those weird decisions. But he, he his career in, for, in senior football was entirely lower grades from from my recollection. I remember reading yeah. about it somewhere or hearing him talk about it somewhere. Yeah. Um, it was entirely low grades, and he pretty much saw that it wasn't going to work out, so he ditched it. Mm. And now I think I'm going to have to find it. Mm-hmm. I think he might have gone to America. Really? Don't quote me on that. It's crazy. <laughs> We're basically just going like, oh man, because no. shit, I what. I, I tried to re, tried to reel in a memory he forgot. It might have been about five or six years ago. Yeah. That he, that he was talking about this. Yeah. Um. So I'm sort of going back that far, and a lot of shits happened since then. <laughs> 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 um. He might have been to America, but I, I know that he became a coach. Mm-hmm. Um. Around that time. But yeah. Ever since he he, he was in Australia as a coach, um. It was he never left Australia. I know that wow. much. I, I don't. I don't know why I've thought that he was over in England for a bit. But anyway, oh, no, he, uh, he he might have been. But I know that from the time he was at the West Tigers, mm-hmm. he went straight from the West Tigers. Oh, so went from the Warriors to the Tigers to Penrith, and yeah. then he became a head coach. He's there's been no time in England. Okay, in that there whole period. Go. There you go. Man, that was punishing. My brain has not worked that hard in decades. Mate, I, I I made a whole career for him over in England, so <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. You know, over uh, in England, he's, he's seen as a very good coach. Oh, just, well. I've never seen him. Well, they, they don't rate him because he never coached in Helens. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he's, look, he's done a great job. And the, the thing that gets me is when you watch the Warriors, they've got a steal about them. You know, they don't – like in this game against Canberra, they had – 
every reason to just wilt, and they didn't. And that's why they won the game. And you felt it like half hour into that game and Canberra had had all the ball. And you just, you felt like the Warriors were going to win it because Canberra hadn't scored enough points. And you knew that once the Warriors got the ball, that they were going to do something with it. And look, they went through the middle of the, the Raiders pack who, the weird thing is out of Canberra, you always hear about these amazing forwards that they all have, who everyone runs through. Um, so yeah, it was a very Canberra event and, you know, they're all, they're all happy. I, I haven't seen what Ricky Stewart has said after the game. You, no doubt he was whinging about something. Um, cause that's what he does, but yeah, good, good on the Canberra Raiders that he's created. It's a big moment for them. That was. Well, they're still in the top eight, so that's something to work on, I guess. Yeah. It's a pretty crazy looking ladder at the moment. Because if, if for some reason, okay, look at this mm-hmm. hypothetical. Mm-hmm. This weekend, Penrith is, yeah, Penrith lose to the Roosters this week. Yeah. And the Broncos lose to the Knights. Yeah. Next week, if, let's see, we look at that. That'll be Penrith and Brisbane both on 20 points. Um, actually, yeah, if South, South and the Sharks win as well this week, they'll both be on 20 points. Mm-hmm. The Warriors and the Raiders will both move up to 20 points with the bye next week. If the Storm win next week, they'll be up to 20 points. You'll have the <laughs> top, top seven will all be on 20. That would be cool. That's, that is nuts. Um, Manly's on 17. And what have we got here? Titans and Dolphins both on 16. Yeah, if the Roosters won, that would put them up to 18. So then they'd jump Manly and they'd be two points off the lead. That just seems nuts because then you'd be looking at a ladder where there'd only be one win between first and ninth. It's been an amazing season. Like the, it, It's my worst tipping season. And the, like it's literally at a point where the games could just, it doesn't matter who's playing who, you could see really any result. Um, and that's fantastic. I, and I think that we're seeing crowds and TV ratings be fantastic because of that too, because everyone's got a chance to win, you know. Um, who, who would you say are, are the team, like if you had to pick two teams to beat this year, like who who do you think will be in the grand final? I still think South are going to be there because mm-hmm. um, I think I don't I don't think they've properly shown us what they can do yet. Yeah, I agree. and I think Penrith have only really fired in one game this year so far. Yeah, so to me they're the only two teams that are still in prime p- position to make the finals, but still have not shown us their full capability yet. And so for me, they those are the two sides. That worry me the most. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, P- Penrith I, and South. I've, I've been I've been on it all year. I think it's going to be Penrith South because I just can't see anyone else be coming close to them. In saying that, oh, yeah. the Broncos the first team this year so far to so get to ten wins. So, um, <clears throat> I feel like when we get to the finals, South are going to really be clicking, and you've always got to worry about injuries with South. But I think that they'll really be clicking. And I, I think that there is that spectre, though, of, you know, we get to the finals and Penrith has, because Cleary's going to be out for a while now. And, um, you know, he'll have had a few weeks back and we get to the finals and, and Penrith starts, like, just being destroyer of worlds all of a sudden. And it's like, oh, shit, you know. It well, seems seems convenient that he gets injured around this time of year for a few weeks. <laughs> it's It's weird. Look, it happened last year and I think that, and we've talked about this, that there was some suspensions and some injuries and stuff. And I think it helped them, the players be a little fresh going into the finals. And so when he got uh, his hamstring injury last week, and then it came out that he was going to be out for say a month or so, I, I, I didn't think it was the worst thing for Penrith because you know, he's going to bounce back and you know that they're not, because they've got such a lot of depth in the halves, they're not going to rush him back. And so I just think that, especially going for the three straight and being up for three straight years is absolutely like, I mean, really, it's devastating physically to go through that much high-level football. 
And so I think any time that any of these players get a break, uh, I think it's a good thing for Penrith, whether it be from, you know, touch wood, you know, minor injuries like a hamstring injury, or if a player gets suspended for a couple of weeks, I think that all, that all plays in to Penrith going having a better chance for going for three straight. The big thing, okay, especially when it comes to Cleary being out, mm. is it automatically makes every single player on that side play 10% harder mm-hmm. because they know that they have to put in a lot more because they're missing their key playmaker. Yeah. And more, and that's going to be why. And that's the bit that should be worrying everybody else in the competition because we know what Luai can do now. He can now play three different fucking positions at once. And that's what's going to happen. Is Penrith's attack is going to start getting better. And people are going to say, oh, they don't need Cleary after all. Going, it's not that they don't. It's not that they're playing better because he's not in the side. They're playing better because they're putting in extra effort to try and accommodate the fact that he's not there so that when he does come back, that attack is firing and he mm. then makes them 10% better again. That's the scary part. And there's something to be said for having a, a system there where, you know, Cleary goes out and they bring in Cogger and, you know, by some miracle, I've got a halfback on the bench. Um, and it's just, he goes straight in and they don't really miss a beat. And, you know, there's not too many teams that can really do that. That's a, a massive luxury. And they had that last year as well with Sullivan, uh, similar situation. It's, it's really interesting. And, you know, looking towards the finals, I think Brisbane are very, very good. And I think on their best day, they could probably beat South and Penrith. But I, I, I'm i like you. I feel as though we're going to get to the finals and it's going to be pretty clear that they're the two best teams and it's just going to be whoever's best on the day. Yeah. Um, speaking of speaking of halves on the bench, mm-hmm. Luke Brooks has got an injury. Mm-hmm. And let's talk that uh, this one's not so much on the bench, but Josh Schuster. He's been, you know, advertised around town as being worth one point two million. <laughs> um, with Cleary out and Brooks down, mm-hmm. who's the third choice halfback for New South Wales now? Well, I saw some people saying Adam Reynolds, and I wouldn't be against that. Nope, his kicking game has been so fucking good this year. Yeah, it. So. If they decided yeah. to go with him, I'd it'd probably be the smart way to go because he's so experienced, you know. Yeah. Speaking of, of experience, and this is this was the comment that uh, Gus Gould agrees with you on. Yeah. He doesn't think Nico Hyde should be there because he's not experienced enough. He wants Mitch Moses to be there because Mitch Moses has got a few extra minutes more experience in Origin. They both okay. played one game each, but he's he's got a few minutes more. I saw a quote, and I don't listen to anything Phil Gould says, you know, but I saw a quote, and it must have been on some newspaper website or something, where it said that if Phil Gould said that Brad Fittler should go down with the ship. And all I could think of was, no, nah, I'd really like Brad Fittler to try and sort this out. <laughs> <laughs> How about steer away from the iceberg? That would be my first thought. That, that's a good idea. Yeah. Maybe maybe reinforce the front of the ship so it can get through the icebergs. Yeah, it's probably you know that'd be that'd be a workaround. Um, can we let's talk about Origin because we didn't do yeah. a, a post Origin episode because I've I've been unwell for the last week so I'm sorry that we didn't get an episode out. But my big takeaway from that game and there was a lot of criticism. There was some there's some weird shit that's been said. Oh, New South Wales don't get Origin. It's a, <coughs> I think it's well that I mean. That's that's what some people say when they don't actually watch the game, don't understand what's been going on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Nathan Cleary, he's no good at origin and stuff. When I look at – when I watched that game, I saw <laughs> a, a very poor coaching performance by Brad Fittler. 100%. Okay. Ex- I, I, okay, so we're on the same because we, me and Andrew haven't talked about this yet. I saw – I saw a team that looked ill-prepared, that didn't look like they'd pl- they'd trained together before, and they obviously had. They had 10 days. I saw 
Like, it was the plan to have Nico Hines on the bench for what reason? Because he come on when we had an injury in the centres. So, and it, that was pretty late in the game. So why the fuck was Nico Hines there in the first place? Agreed. <laughs> okay. So, and, and yeah, I, so all I saw, and the other thing that got me was people were saying about the Penrith halves, and they're like, oh, they're no good at origin. Why is Nathan Cleary and Luai playing so far apart on the field where they're not able to link up. They're just like, they're in different fucking parts of the football field completely. Yep. There's no linking up between them. Oop. That's coaching. Yep. Even Dummer was the fact that their link player, who is really good at playing both sides of the field, and that is James Tedesco, was parked out on the right-hand side of the field. And why was he there? Because Tom Trebojevic was doing absolutely fucking nothing. Mm-hmm. He was he was so poor and so ineffective, they had to make Tyson Frizzell play as the second man in from the sideline. How wide? He was in. He was past the Gareth Ellis corridor. Yeah, yeah. He was, was so crazy. wide in attack. At one and point, so, he got the ball, and he was he was outside of the winger. Yeah. And so Tedesco was out on that side, and people were criticizing him as well for hogging the ball and going, well, no, he's, he's ball running because that's his strength. He's trying to run run his side forward. He's trying to get momentum that way. So here's what's happened to okay? came. A lot of people are criticizing Cleary. Um, I'm not going to say he had a great game, but no. it's not as bad as what they were making out. And part of the reason is Queensland know exactly who to target and all game. They were on Cleary's ass, either be it from dummy half, their marker there, or their second rows and centers. They'll be rushing up on Cleary all game. And because New South Wales, as you said, had their two halves so far apart, when Cleary got the ball and he's getting pounded by the defence, he's got no one to link up with who can take the kick pressure off him. Mm-hmm. Coruscant is in the middle somewhere, or he's just past the ball, so he's in front of him, so he can't pass it back to him. Lua is miles away on the other side of the field. And Tedesco is playing on the right-hand side because Trebojevic isn't there. So he's got no kicker around him. And I'm not saying Tedesco's a kicker, but he can do some sort of kicking. He could have been somewhat productive there. Yeah. So... He had no second option for kicks around him. So he's had to put up constant Hail Mary kicks. Mm-hmm. And the problem with that was no Blues players were chasing through on those kicks. No, no. It happened once or twice and that was it. So he's putting up these Hail Mary kicks. And the problem, the reason why all this is happening is because there was no genuine variance in what New South Wales was going to throw at Queensland in attack. You have a look at every single set. It broke down the same way. Made mm-hmm. strong metres through the middle and on the edges of the ruck and then got to the last tackle, you said, and Queensland just rushed up on Cleary. They went, you know what, we'll let you have as many metres up the middle you want. We know what we're going to do. We're going to target Cleary in defence. He's going to put up a Hail Mary if we can defuse those. And, man, fucking Reese Walsh was on fire. He covered those kicks so well all night. Mm-hmm. I made one tweet at the time and said, if you ever want to find Reese Walsh, just look at the end of a Nathan Cleary kick. He's going to be <laughs> on the end of it. <laughs> that's and fantastic. that's what it was. I don't think he dropped one all night. He was so fucking good. But that's all yeah. it took. Yeah, yeah. And the the thing is too, like, if you think of every great moment in State of Origin, it all begins around the ruck, okay? And when you spread your playmakers across the field like that, you get no pressure around the ruck because the defense isn't having to worry that the hooker and the halfback are gonna do something crafty around the ruck. Or that and when and then you've get the defense start to panic and then he puts it out to his five eighth and he's got Tedesco outside of him and he might have Trebojevic outside him. Like there was none of that because they, it's like they were playing in quadrants or something across the field. I didn't understand it whatsoever. And it just negated all of the things that they were all good at. Yeah. And to touch on what you're saying before too about um Nico Hines. Mm-hmm. If Tom Trebojevic hadn't got injured, was Hines ever going to get used? And if not, why put him there? Put a forward there. Yeah. But then when you put him on the field, why put him at centre? Like, yeah, he's he's Tedes- never been a, He's too small. That's right. And Tedesco has played centre before, mm-hmm. and he'd been playing it all night. So why not just put Tedesco at centre, Hines at fullback? Then you've got the fullback that Cleary needs to help him out of jail because in attack... Hines will be in the middle. He'll be near Cleary somewhere. So if Cleary's getting pounded, Hines could have taken the kick. He could have made a pass. He could have got the ball to Luai, right? You could have had 
a person there to help out then. And if you needed a runner, Tedesco's still there on Cleary's outside. It, well, you, that you would know have made I more think, sense. It would have, right? But you know where I think it all comes from? A, a couple of years ago, there was a State of Origin game where Queensland had Ponga on the bench, and he was a bit of a, a weird selection. And they brought Ponga on, I think it was in the second half, mm-hmm. and he was playing like a lock position which yeah. is really weird for him. But he started carving up New South Wales because then they had this extra playmaker that was in the middle of the field. I feel as though that has always stuck with Brad Fittler. And that's kind of what he wanted to happen in this game. The problem is Ponga is a very different sort of player. Like he's a, he's a fullback slash five eighth. He's, he's a really good person to have for that role. And, Hines isn't that sort of player. Like Hines is, Hines is just a different player. He's got different skill set. And but I I feel as though that it was like a scarring moment for New South Wales, and it was like, man, that works so well against us. Imagine if we did that to them. And it's like, no, that's not how you select your team. You got to select your team on the strengths that you actually have, not on what you would like Hines to be able to do if he was Callan Ponga. Mm. Uh, it's nuts. I, I've, I've never been a fan of Tom Travoy, which has been picked at centre. Even though he may have played the odd occasional good game for New South Wales there. Mm. If he was any good at centre, he'd be playing at centre for Manly. Well, you know? and the other thing Ruben is Garrick's you... a better centre than Tom Trebojevic is. Well, and... And no, I'm not saying that as slurring on Ruben Garrick. He's a good centre. He's, He's a good much center, better yeah. at it than Tom Trebojevic is. Well, and to to leave Campbell Graham out is was a crime. Yeah. It was a crime. I mean, he you've got this young dude. He's big. He's a fantastic defender. In fact, he started his career as a defensive specialist, has turned into a fantastic attacking player. When we didn't select him, Queensland must have been cheering. Oh, God, yeah. He's in, and he's been in unbelievable form for two years now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Proved himself him. over in the World Cup as well. Yeah, phenomenal player. Love him, man. He's a fucking great to watch. Yeah. Um, and we didn't pick him. And I went. That's that's immediately an error. Yeah. Massive fuck up that is. So New South Wales is going to do New South Wales things. They're going to do wholesale wild changes, but they won't be changing too many of the players that they need to. So I wouldn't be surprised if Tom Trebojevic is picked again mm-hmm. out of position. I wouldn't be surprised if Nico Hines is selected again on the bench. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't think they'll get rid of Luai. So I don't know who they'll bring in as halfback. Yeah. I'd... I wouldn't even be surprised. Okay, and I'm not saying this is what should happen. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if they do something fucking stupid, like move Luai to halfback and put White in a 5 eight. There's some weird fucking insistence within this uh, New South Wales origin thing, mm. coaching staff, that you must have a ball running 5 eight, not an organising playmaking one. You can't have Cameron Munster playing for New South Wales. <laughs> well, you that's can't have why, that. That's why, like, Luai playing at, in his favoured position at 5'8", that feels like a breath of fresh air for New South Wales for some strange reason. And it's because, like, it's not been too often since Laurie Daly retired that we've had a specialist 5'8 play 5'8". They've always yeah. liked to fuck around for some reason. I've well, got these difference. ball runners there. Like, they're, they're trying to use... Little Lua is some sort of fucking battering ram. Mm. You're going, that's not how he plays the game. Well, and like, you look the way he plays. His footwork is unbelievable, and people don't give him enough credit for it. Um, but that footwork doesn't, it's not as effective when you get the ball out wide because your defence is set differently, that sort of footwork is devastating in the middle of the field. And that's what we saw in the World Cup. When he was playing a halfback hooker and 5 8 for Samoa, his footwork was absolutely tearing opposition teams apart because he was doing it in the middle of the field. When he's out wide, and this is a problem that he has for Penrith as well, he goes out wide and he tries to use his footwork as you would to try and make something happen. Now, not only does he it, is it not as effective out wide, but then you need to have options on the inside as well as the outside for a player like him who's a playmaker. Penrith don't do that, and neither did New South Wales. And no. so you end up, you're just killing your halves. Yeah. And look, what 
always work well with uh, with Lua is he had Kickout able to run like change his line and run a different line on the inside. Yeah. And there's not a there's not a Kickout runner in in Penrith. Nope. Nor is there one in New South Wales at the moment. And so what you'll find with Lua is you'll start pushing his winger off the field because he starts drifting too far to the side. Yeah, because he's trying to make he's trying to make something happen. He's trying That's to make right. the best of a bad situation, and it's it comes back to coaching. And we've talked about this with Penrith, like uh, I, you know, Ivan Cleary needs to sort that shit out because he has two of the best halves in the world to work with, and I feel as though between Ivan Cleary and Brad Fittler, they they're just not making the most of those players. They need to be further in field. No, no, I fully agree. Um... I thought though, on on some good news for you. I thought Liam Martin was fucking great. Oh, he. There was a point where I was not sure about him. He was he was a bit erratic. He would drop the ball a lot, and or he would give away bad penalties. And over the last probably eighteen months, he's he's just turned into like a machine. He, he's turned into one of those. Like, uh, and you don't see him very often, representative hitmen, where they just come onto the field and they change everything. They're smashing people. They're running hard lines. No one wants to tackle them because they're running off the back fence. It's fantastic. And he's done, done the same thing for Penrith as well. It's been great. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I, it's hard to take anything good out of that game. Um, and I don't know what to make of it. Like, I, I don't mm. know what they were trying to do with Hines. It, it looks like they they genuinely had zero clue what to do with him. Yeah. And I, I genuinely felt fucking sorry for him because, yeah. I mean, they just put him in a position where he just had to tackle. I'm going, what a waste. Yeah. Like, you know what this guy can do. Why? Why? Why put him in that position? Like, you know you're a hiding to nothing. And Queensland scored down his side straight away. And that's not through anything he did wrong. Yeah. He's out of position. And so the communication with his winger just wasn't there. Because, you know, he would not have trained a fucking minute of his life at centre. Exactly. And that's the thing. Like, what was the plan? You know? It, and it... There can't have been one. He come on. It was pretty late in the game that that happened. You know, um, I've never understood. I always think an Origin level you pick three forwards on the bench and a, a big dude who can be a bit of a utility player. You know, yeah, like um, like that, like Talakai they had the year before. You'd put him on the bench, not at centre, on the yeah. bench, so you can put him in the middle, on the edge, in the backs. Doesn't matter. He can do all of it. That's what you yeah. want. Yeah. Um, that's what I said when they had Hines in the squad. I thought, well, he's got to be in the in the thirteen somewhere. But they've covered all the game, all the playmakers. And as we discussed, like you suggested, maybe they're going to put him at six and Luai at nine or something like that. Yeah, I, look, I was waiting for that to happen, and it, it I was I was waiting and waiting and waiting, and it just didn't happen. And I was like, <laughs> what's the plan? And then I think at one point they were like, Hines is getting up. And I'm like, oh, we're going to see the plan in place. And then he sat back down for about 20 more minutes. And, you know. It was I, so stupid. It really was. And and then it felt like Queensland just sort of stuck strong and waited and waited until New South Wales made the mistakes. And they capitalised on it. Um, I thought the Queensland – I said going in, I thought the Queensland pack looked really, really good. I liked the balance that they had. Um, and just the overall look of the Queensland team, I thought it was a little bit better than New South Wales. And then to come out of it, and I, I sort of think, well, New South Wales look, looked like a poorly coached team that didn't really have a plan in place. And Queensland looked like they just did the job. And you come out of it and it's like, oh, well, New South Wales doesn't know origin and blah, blah, blah. And it's like they were saying the same thing about Queensland when they lost series, you know. It, it's... It's silly some of the stuff that people carry on with. I always think that these series come down to talent. I really do. Like at the end of that game, the the most talented players that they had available for both sides, the Queensland side looked way more like uh, cohesive. Yeah. And then the New South Wales team, which kind of looked like a bits and pieces team by the end of the game. I think that's 
I mean, that's, some of that comes down to coaching. And I think we saw with, with Mal Meninga at origin level, mm. he got what to do when it came to star players. Is They don't need to be taught how to like, line up with fucking inside shoulders, outside shoulders. You don't mm. need that fucking shit. They know how to do that. That's why they're mm. in origin. Mm. You just got to say, right, this is what our targets are going to be and this is what we're going to do. Yeah. And that's what Queensland did. They just went, right, make sure we're on Cleary on the fourth and fifth tackles. Don't worry about the other ones. Fourth and fifth, don't give him any room. That's it. If we can, try and rush up on Cleary's side of the field to make them, get, you know, early. Mm. I only saw this a few times. and I wasn't paying a huge amount of attention to him doing doing it, but I saw a few times I would rush up on – I think Cleary is out on the, the right-hand side. So they charge up on the right-hand side of the field for the first, uh, for the second and third tackles, the Queensland edge defence. Charge up there so the Coruscant would send the ball left out to Luai, which would then leave Luai parked out on the left. So yeah. when they got to the end of the set, clear his way over on the right-hand side. Bam, mm-hmm. isolated. And then you just run two people at him because he had no runners around him either. So he just put a fucking kick up. Yeah. It's it's so simple. Yeah, and look, if I'm if I'm but Queensland, eighty minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But if I'm Queensland, what don't I want to see? I don't want to see Coruscant and Cleary and Luai working together as a unit in the middle of the field. I do not want to see that, no. especially with Coruscant and Luai with their footwork. You know, and then we've talked about Cleary is a great ball runner in terms of just being a a player, let alone a halfback. Like there are, that's a three nightmare scenario players right there, but when you spread them all across the, the fucking field, and you isolate them from each other, yeah, and, and they're and easy it, to pick off. Yeah, it, that's, the just, thing I, that's the big criticism I've got to clear is that he should have seen what was going on and just gone, you know what, I'm just going to park myself on the left hand side. Yeah, like to hell with it. They're going to say that we're out here, but at least we're throwing something a bit different at them, and just didn't. I think that that's probably the one thing you could say about Cleary at the moment as a player. And I I can – the ad-lib side of it, like he can play ad-lib football, we've seen it. Mm. But I think the next level for him is to change the game plan off his own back on the run. Now, I understand why he doesn't do it for Penrith because he doesn't have to. You that's know, right. That's it, right. Every, it all works at Penrith. Um, it, when you get to origin level, you want to see your halfback, you know, be able to go in and say, look, this isn't working. Let's try something different. I can see where Cleary as a player doesn't have that in him because he's, you only know what you know, and he has never known that. Yeah. Well, he knows, he knows how to work really well within a set structure. Yeah. Um, doesn't matter what the set structure is and what it changes to. He picks it up and he sticks to it like glue. It works for him. He understands that. That's how he functions. Mm-hmm. Um, but having to change that structure on the fly, like Cherry Evans and Munster can do, mm-hmm. he struggles with that bit of it. And unless the... unless his side is ahead on the scoreboard, so he doesn't have the scoreboard pressure on him. He can do a bit more of the changing things up a little bit because the fear of it costing you the game is much less. Yeah, and he plays it in a club side where there's a because of how good their defense is, they can play percentages a lot. So you can do the basic thing, and eventually, and because you're relying on your defense, which is like one of the best defensive sides in the history of the game, you know you, you're probably going to get on the right side of the scoreline by the end of the game. Doesn't work that way in Origin. Um, and look, in the World Cup last year, we saw Luai change game plans sometimes two or three times in a game, depending on what was going on around him and dominate those changes and dominate the game with those changes that he implemented. I've got no doubt Cleary can do that, but I wonder, I wonder if he's been empowered to do that as well. I don't know that he is. It's hard to tell. I mean, does Nathan Cleary look like a halfback that feels like he's in control? Does, does, does he look like a halfback for New South Wales that feels like it's his team? I can't. I think Ricky Stewart was the last halfback I saw with that. 
And that's not a slot on either halfback since then. I don't think any halfback that's been coming into that New South Wales structure mm-hmm. for a long time, especially in the last 15 years, has been given that ability or authority or role. I think they're all told, yeah. we need you to do this, 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 these three things. Like, don't be a playmaker, just do this. Pass the ball to this guy. Mm-hmm. How long, exactly. How long do we have a game plan that was in place where Pierce, your job is to just pass it to a forward? We don't mm-hmm. care which one, just pass it to a forward. Exactly. Inside ball to a forward. Happened every fucking play. And then kick to the corner. And like, th- just, and- just watching fucking Mitchell Moses playing footy. Exactly. And, you know, we end up with these one-dimensional halfback performances because of it. Like, when Ant- when Andrew Johns was picked as a halfback for New South Wales and they come into camp, guess who was running that fucking team, you know? Mm. It wasn't the coach. It was Andrew Johns. You know, Andrew Johns was telling everyone where he fucking wanted them to be. And he didn't have to tell them why. He just told them. We haven't had a halfback that has had that sort of ownership of it. And then when you look at the other side of the field, it's been the complete opposite. Like, to the point where someone like Cherry Evans can just wait back, wait back, guide the team, guide the team, and when it's time to play, boom, he he, he takes over. Munster's been the same, you know. Um, this, and actually, this is the thing that Queensland coaches get that New South Wales doesn't, and it's got nothing yes. to do with a Queensland versus New South Wales history thing. You don't get origins, nothing like that. No. It's when Queensland picks their halfback, they then pick a team that complements what that halfback does. Mm. When New South Wales picks a team, they pick a halfback, and then they pick all the players who will do what the coaches want them to do. Yeah. And, not and they not shooting anyone's game plan. <laughs> exactly. And look, when when – Billy Slater brings all of his players in and he's talking with DCA. And keep in mind, he's not that much older than DCA, you know. No. Uh, he's talking to his halves as equals. Whereas I mm. feel as though with the New South Wales structure of things, they bring the halfbacks in and they tell them what they want them to do. Yeah. And, and it doesn't work. Because there are times in that game we saw, we basically saw Mitchell Pearce playing. Yeah. And, as again, I, I'm not, I'm not shitting on Clear. Hell, I'm not even shitting on Mitchell Pearce. A lot of people like to shit on Mitchell Pearce about his Origin career, but when you look at how Cleary's played a lot of his time in Origin, you start to see that there's just certain structures that are put in place that the Origin coaches and coaching systems have always wanted to have in there, mm-hmm. and it just filters on through, and it just keeps doing it. Daly did it. And, you know, Fittler was in his assistant coaching team, you know, and, and so was Andrew Johns. The only difference now is Laurie Daly's not there. Well, the, the only time we really saw, uh, probably in the last 15 to 20 years now, is remember the season that Bellamy took over, mm-hmm. and he completely, he picked a very different team. It was a very, very mobile pack, and it was a weird team. And it, it almost worked. Didn't quite work. He was playing against a team that was far superior in terms of talent. Oh yeah. But, but he tried something different, and it almost worked. And he was he was basically one and done. He was like, you know, that's me done. Yeah. Um. And, and as you say, around that, there's been these weird coaching situations for New South Wales. It's it's disappointing, and it, I think that it does a disservice to the players we've had. Because I've got no doubt you can get. You got Luai and uh, Cleary together. You could put any single sort of game plan you wanted. Cleary's been around professional football since he can remember, and we saw Luai what he can do. Um, you could do whatever you wanted with those players. That's why it's so frustrating to see them playing the most fucking vanilla football you can possibly imagine at Origin level because they're capable of so much more than that. I fully agree with that. Fully agree. Um. Yeah, they they need to have a new. Look, I think the the best thing New South Wales could do for future Origin series because they're not going to do it for this one mm-hmm. is not have any Johns involved in the assistant coaching thing. And yeah. I know, I know we make our jokes about how they come up with a lot of shit ideas. Um, you know about how to improve the game, but to me it's pretty clear that they are very one dimensional as far as assistant coaching goes. 
Mm-hmm. And Matthew Johns has a better track record than Andrew does, but I think Andrew has a bigger presence within the New South Wales coaching structure than Matthew does. As Matthew is at least able to spot strengths and weaknesses of the halves and how to work with the strengths that they've got, whereas Andrew just wants them to play the way he wants his five eights to play when he was playing the game, which is Sean yes. Rudder. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. and that's the problem. That's and, the and, problem. Yeah, and that's where you get to that point of they when they all go into camp, who's the voice? And, and it's not the voice hasn't been the New South Wales halves for a fucking long time. No. You know, when people go into camp, the person that's, you know, telling everyone what they want them to do has not been the halfback. And that's why I asked the question that, you know, does it look like this is Nathan Cleary's team? And and it just, it feels like he's the guy that's there for now, which is insane because he's the best halfback in the game at the moment. Yeah. So, like, so the problem's not with the talent on the field. The resume is there. We know what they can do when it, the games fucking count. We've watched it. Yeah. So where's the problem? And, and I think the problem is the coaching. And I think that we've seen New South Wales, you know, go well in series and it has uh, glossed over some of the coaching things that Brad Fittler has done where you kind of have looked at them and said, well, what the fuck was going on there? And it's happened to work out okay for him. Whereas I, I think that for the most part, it doesn't. Exactly. Now, speaking of coaching. Yes. The Dragons need a new coach. Yeah, still. Still. <laughs> speaking and, of having uh, no plans. Yeah. Well, have you seen who's on the shortlist? L- last I saw, they were working really hard to get uh, Flanagan. Yep. He's, um, he's their shortlist. <laughs> yeah. And the fact... <laughs> well, they they... Got Jason Riles in, and Jason, they were ready to give him the fucking keys. And Jason Riles said, look, I will take over, but I need to get rid of all of these fucking people that have ruined the club in the football department. And basically the Dragon said, well, no, we're going to keep all of those people. And so Riles said, thank you, have a nice day, and signed a contract to be the assistant coach at the Melbourne Storm for a couple yes. of years. He chose to leave the club that he'd spent most of his career as as a player. Mm-hmm. And where he currently owns a house and lives mm-hmm. to move to a completely different state. <laughs> and wait for the current coach there to yeah. retire, who yeah. is going to retire when they bury him. Yeah, but when, when he wants to. It. Simple as that, when he wants to. Yeah, He yeah. chose that option. He could have been a head coach straight away and he's gone, nope. And that to me says he's a much smarter man than everyone ever gave him credit for because he knows that the best way to become a long-term coach is to start with a successful beginning. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to have that at the Dragons at the moment. No. And no. he told me, I mean, he proved it. He told them exactly what they needed to hear. And there's a lot of shit listen. that needs to change. And they went, not going to happen, buddy. <laughs> and didn't and the, the crazy thing for me is that like, if you come into a situation and so, somebody says, like, I always think that the if you're going to bring in a new head coach, you're handing over the keys to the guy to make all of the changes he basically wants, all right? Because if you're not going to do that, well, then you don't really want a new coach, do you? But for him to be able to sit there and say, look at your track record for recruitment, look at your track record for junior development, it's terrible. So I want to change who's in those positions. And they still said no. They still said no. It's crazy. So I've heard people suggesting uh, Des Hasler would be perfect. I went, mm, nope. You know what? Des Hasler probably wouldn't be a bad idea as the origin coach. I I, I wouldn't because put him down as the origin coach. He doesn't need other people to be his assistant coaches who are former yeah. players. Yeah. He would actually be a, a really decent he, and you, he could get two as an assistant coach. That would be a perfect pairing. That would be fine. That would I'd be, be happy with that. be a good uh, New South Wales coach in his own right too. That's right. But that's the job they should have. I don't want. I don't think they should 
have Haslow being a NRL quality coach anymore. Sticking with Origin, you could be coaching the test side, things like that. That's that's what I reckon he'd be fine at. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't put him there. Who was another one? Uh, God, there was one other name. I can't remember what it was now. But yeah, Flano was at the top of the list. I went, he fits the bill. He's a former Dragons player. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got past um, success. <laughs> let's let's go with that. Yep. Um, hashtag. Not hashtag <laughs> asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag. Jeez. And uh, look, the one thing that he, he does know how to do is compile strong forwards rosters. He's pretty average when it comes to getting halves. Um, I just can't rely on anything he did when he was at the Sharks. Cause I know, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look past the, the stupid shit he did and all the illegal shit he did. And the just systematic at, cheating at every single yeah. way he possibly could have. And just trying to look at what he did that was legal. Mm-hmm. So the, the squads that he did compile, um, the, he always compiled squads that were forwards heavy. And especially... Uh, like he's, he'd make his props running a little bit wider of the ruck, which would probably suit the dragon style a little bit. Um, so that's, but that is genuinely it, and that's something that any other coach could probably learn how to do if they needed to. But uh, I, I don't know. To me, it just seems fitting that Flano would end up coaching there. Hey, it'd probably take a little bit of heat off Debellin for a little bit. <laughs> True. <laughs> that what they really should do is just keep the current guy there. I mean, he's not doing. Obviously, they love everybody that's in the front office, and when I say the front office, I mean the football department side of things. Um, they they're all mates. They're not going to sack anyone for no matter how bad they go. The if that's too, the way, they, they want a yes man as their coach. Yeah. When yeah. did you ever hear Flano complaining about the board? Yeah, he's a yes man. It's perfect. Well, and, and the they just they should leave the current guy there. You know, he'll do the job. He won't complain about anything uh, because you know it's his first job. He's he probably couldn't can't believe he's in the role at the moment. And that's not against anything against him. It's just the situation he's found himself in. Good luck to him, you know. And I yeah. think he's done an all right job so far. But they they don't want to make changes. Then don't change anything. Okay, second people. Yeah, it's, it's such a weird thing. It's weird when you get a football team that gets bogged down in everyone just protects their job, hey? Yeah. Penrith has been in that position in the past, and it's the it's a dark place to be in because there's no way out of that. There's As a fan, you're just watching your club, you know, go around in circles, and they make excuses for how poor they are. It sucks. It does. It does. It's a pretty weird situation they've got too with that Ryan Carr there at the moment because um, he's only oh – God, I remember looking at this the other day. He's only a few months older than Ben Hunt. Yeah. Oh, it might be a year, a year older than Ben Hunt, but it's it's not by much. And he's doing an all right job. You know? Yeah. He, he's changed things a little bit from, from when Hook left, and I think he's – He's doing an all right job. They should just keep him. If they don't want any changes, don't change him. Because obviously the, the club has turned into a lifestyle club for everyone that works there. You know, oh, it's yeah. not, they don't want to win. No, nah, they're, they're, they're adopting a very strong West Tigers culture. They really are. <laughs> <laughs> well, the recruitment, we've talked about this, the recruitment mm-hmm. of the West Tigers is way better over the last few years than it has been for the fucking Dragons. Yeah. The retention of the Dragons in the last few years has been the worst I can think of in recent times. Think of that forward pack that a few years ago and how dominant that was yeah. and how none of it's there now except oh. for one bloke who's – he's we turned to shit anyway. We absolutely loved that pack. Yeah. We loved it. It was phenomenal. Yeah. And they killed it in the space of 18 months. Yeah. It was fucking remarkable. And, that, the, but, and they don't sign anyone. They're not no. ever in the, the race to sign anyone. Hey, I, I, they, they had Aaron Woods. Yeah. They recruited Test. a guy that had a fucking hip replacement. 
test superstar. Aaron Woods. Remember when that? You know, when I was when I was watching the fucking Raiders tonight, and Hudson Young's out there, and didn't he show what he was in fucking Origin? Like, you never listen to the Raiders when they say you gotta you gotta have this guy in Origin. He's really really fucking good. Shut the fuck up, Raiders. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, Hudson Young, please. He was uh, he was a non-event. He really was. It's like that's why Queensland won't pick fucking Corey Horsburgh. They know better than that. And geez, Horsburgh ran rings around uh, Young tonight. It's not difficult though. <laughs> <laughs> no, certainly was not that. It's like Hudson Young did the fucking Ryan Madison. One and done. <laughs> now, uh, I'm wondering who Sebastian Chris could play for, because he's he's a unique. It's a unique beast when it comes to um, origin eligibility. Mm -hmm. What's that? Well, he's born in Canberra. Poor cunt. Um, But his family are uh, New Zealanders. So he played played for New Zealand uh, in 2022. Not that that playing for a tier one nation is an issue, because, you know, there's people from other countries that that have played origin in the past. I mean, there's also the most prominent one. There's also the thing that International Rugby League doesn't exist at the current stage. Nor does International Rugby League rules even apply to the origin anyway. So, you know, yeah, true, true. people are going to stop hanging their hat on that like it's something. It's yeah, not. that's very true. Remember when that, yes. the fucking right honourable was going on about origin <laughs> eligibility? It's like, <laughs> shut the fuck up, mate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, haven't you got a PO box to fucking register somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet they owe the fucking the money for that too. Anyway, uh, they just get it from the uh, the Australian one. It'll all be there somewhere. Yeah. Um, what else has been going on? Hasn't well, hasn't the the air gone out of the West Tigers since they absolutely dicked the Cowboys? <laughs> oh man, they were going to win the premiership after that game. It, People have sort of gone what, cold on them again. <laughs> You had a real fucking good three weeks there, Andrew. <laughs> what it was, was it like? <laughs> it was a good run. It was a good run. <laughs> Is that the most successful period the club's had since 2000? <laughs> yeah, they probably had four wins in three games. <laughs> uh, I oh, think, shit. I think it might have been, you know. Oh, shit. I'm going to look back. Oh, yeah, this is – okay, now it went from being funny to being, like, a bit sad really quickly. Huh? <laughs> like now I feel like – but I feel kind of nauseous. Oh, they, uh, had, they had three wins in four games in 2021. Oh, there you go. Again, and in, and in that run of three games, they beat Penrith there as well too. Yeah, it's weird they keep beating Penrith. Ah, you know. That's because you're so salty. Well, you know, we're always obsessing about – it's the West Tigers and uh, – the Canberra Raiders. We, they're, they're the only two teams we obsess about, eh? We, yeah, well, you know, we own your souls. <laughs> <laughs> we don't play for premierships. We just play for wins over Penrith <laughs> yeah. at Origin time. That's two years out. A fucking a proper club. Fuck the That's premierships. Right. Yeah. Anyone can win a premiership. Christ, the Tigers did that in 2005. We don't need to win another one. We can do it. They give one of those trophies away every fucking year. Yeah. How much is it really worth? They've yeah. given away hundreds of them. God, if it was worth that much, we wouldn't have dropped the fucking thing. <laughs> Neither would the Raiders. <laughs> and they fucking broke it. Who cares? They smashed it. They yeah. fucking smashed it. Um, that was back when, like, it was treated like a football team winning a competition and they fucked the trophy. And I was like, oh, that's pretty funny. And then this time around, it was like someone had punched gra- your grandmother in the face. It's like, fuck, what's going on? Yeah, it's pretty pretty crazy. Yeah. Should we um have a look at what was going on over in England? Yeah, I've well... Not, I've not paid any attention to it, by the way. Yeah, okay. So there was... In, in English Rugby Union, mm-hmm. in the top-level Premiership rug, Rugby Union, yep. they've had, like, three clubs basically die in the last about year um, to the point where these teams, uh, there's not a chance to revive them some of them have dropped back like a cup down, you know, a bunch of levels. And so they've got this massive crisis. And, and they're the teams, like there's another few teams that are in, when I say gigantic financial trouble, I mean, if the NRL 
had the same debts that these single clubs have, you would be really worried about the financial situation the overall NRL is. Like, the the massive, massive debt. And it made me think during the week about how Rugby League in the UK should uh, capitalise on this situation because there are a bunch of supporter bases now in the south of England who are rugby fans who, and I mean rugby is in legal union, just overall rugby fans who have lost their clubs and should the Rugby Football League look to capitalise on it? Now, you don't just want to put it, you know, plonk a team down there and try and do the same thing because you'll lose, you'll lose money as well. Like there's a reason these clubs died. But what are some of the things that they can do to at least put on a show in the south of England to maybe get some new people on board to have a look at rugby league and not gatekeep it either, not say, oh, your sport's shit and this is the real rugby league. You should be watching this. It's better. It's faster and all that stuff. Just put on the show and say, look, if you were a member of these clubs, you get in for free. Show us your membership, you know. And try and get some people on board from the south that maybe are looking for a new club to follow. Yeah, it's it's amazing because there's so much about how the Premiership Rugby competition over there is run very similar to what Super League's trying to do with their competition. You go, mm. why would you do that? And surely now, after this year, you go, okay, maybe we should avoid that that structure. Yeah. Um, just looking on their website now, the the Worcester Warriors and the Wasps were suspended from the league, and the results have been removed from the table. And mm. London Irish are the ones that are going to be folding at the end of this year because they haven't been able to find a buyer. Yeah, like these aren't small clubs; these are some of their most famous clubs yeah. that are just dying in the ass. And that's three of them so at the know? moment. They're at 11 clubs, which is less than the current Super League. It's just mm-hmm. got 12, and they're going to be down to 10 next year. And they're talking about, in the north of England, merging the Leeds Rugby Union team, which is called the Tykes, with the Newcastle Falcons Rugby Union team, which basically just kills Rugby Union in the north of England in terms of a club competition. Um, it's It's... A devastating moment for English Rugby Union's club competition. And I just think there's an opportunity there for Rugby League to step in at a very different price point too because, you know, how much it costs to run a a Super League club is minuscule compared to how much these teams that lost all this money uh, were spending in the Rugby Union club competitions. Mm. And I just think it's a chance to maybe do something where, you know, could you put on some a nines competition in London in the winter and try and get some new supporters that way? Should they play some games on the road? Should the next Magic Round be somewhere in the south next year if they continue to do Magic Round? They're thinking of getting Mate, rid of it. but I've had an idea. Okay. Right. Whoever owns the London Broncos, mm-hmm. they go and buy London Irish, mm-hmm. right? And they say, right, after the grand finals are done at the end of this year, we're going to have the ultimate battle to find out which is better, legal union, mm-hmm. London Irish to take on the London Broncos mm-hmm. and just fill the London Irish team with a bunch of fucking unknown people out of the nearest pub <laughs> and have the London Broncos fucking built 16 shades of shit out of them. And they win 135 points to nil or whatever. They kick like five, five disgraceful penalty uh, field goals just for fucking fun. <laughs> and they go, well, I mean, that's pretty dim- convincing, isn't it? Why are you people watching the inferior rugby when you could have been watching rugby league all these years? See, see, that's some gatekeeping, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, tr- I'm trying to give a fucking olive branch here to these people. <laughs> That need a new club. You want to no. crush their souls just a little bit more. I just, want to, I just want to throw the olive at them and say, and you'll never see where the branch of this came off. Yeah, and honestly, I respect that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying to get some new people into the game. I just so, think that, how how would this not work? <laughs> rugby usually out there making their tries worth 37 fucking points and field goals are worth 15. If we're out there picking their team by 135 points, that's what they want to see. 
all of these rugby union people are like, you know what? Everything I've been following my entire life is shit. I think I will watch rugby league. <laughs> okay, I'll take. I'll, I'll give you this as, as evidence of how they love watching points being scored. Okay. The top, t- the team at the top of the ladder in the Premiership rugby at the moment, Saracens. Yeah. Fifteen wins, five losses. Mm-hmm. They've scored six hundred and twenty-two points and conceded five hundred and thirteen. What? They've only lost five games. Well, yeah. What? That doesn't yeah. even make sense. Yeah. That's, That's weird. That is nuts. They've scored That's 78 crazy. tries and conceded 64. The... <laughs> yeah. It's all about the points, baby. Yeah, fuck it. Tell them that their sport is shit. <laughs> fuck it. It is shit. It's a shit sport. That's their best team. I just... But what do you think of my idea that... Do you think that the Rugby Football League should capitalise on it in some... It shouldn't be aggressive, but it should be in a smart way, in a subtle way. I think the only way you do it is it's going to come across as as aggressive, but they should because they've been pissants the whole time previously. Mm -hmm. Now's the time to go, you know what? We're not insolvent. We're still going strong. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. And they should go out. They should make make a name for themselves. They should make a bit of fucking noise, rattle a bucket. I don't care what they do. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, absolutely. Go after them. Now, I, I wrote an article during the week. My fingers still work, funnily enough. That's, that's what she amazing, said. amazing because yeah. I stopped writing years ago. I know, I know. <laughs> um, they, that was 50% of the content on my site when you stop writing, you fuck. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just yell and laugh into a fucking microphone now. That does oh, all the work for me. So much easier. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> you don't have to edit it. Nah, look, if you want to turn in an article, you just get one of those, you know, speech to text fucking programs and it can do the whole lot. Yeah, I haven't used one of them in a long time. I hope that they work good. If they work good now, I'd just be doing articles all day. Yeah, just talking to a microphone. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so I wrote this week, and I, I, I felt as though there was an opportunity there, and I wondered if you would, if I was the Rugby Football League, should I offer a franchise in London? And I know we've got the Broncos and Scholars, right? But what if you put up for tender a, a Super League franchise in London and you tried to get the NRL or an NRL club on board? Because the as I wrote during the week, one of the things that I think would be very, very cool is if you got the Penrith Panthers owning a London Rugby League club and they use that team to for as for all the extra talent they've got, you know, um, they could keep them under contract. It'd have to. They wouldn't be able to play in the NRL. Like you go over to London, you're there for the year, you know. But it's a chance for them, with all of the talent they've got in the lower grades, to give them a different experience, a chance to go on to somewhere else. Um, or you know, because I know the. I'm pretty sure the Melbourne Storm. I think somebody messaged me during the week saying the Melbourne Storm are involved with the Scholars on some level. Um, they they might be. I'm not too sure. Yeah, I, I thought the Brisbane Broncos were involved with the London Broncos. Did they not buy the London Crusaders when they were the Crusaders? Did they not buy them at the end of 1994? I, I, I that all they've been through a couple of different owners since then. I, I think that's what that, that was. That was the large reason why they changed to being called the London Broncos because they were owned by the, Bron- the Brisbane Broncos. Yeah, it w- it was, but I think that uh, it's the Super it's League put it into that. Yeah, because because at one point I think after that they're owned by Richard Branson. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, there was another. At one point, I'm pretty sure they were owned by Harlequins Rugby Union Club. Yes, that would make sense too. Yeah. Yeah. And but but the London Broncos are a fucking basket case, like. How, how many times do you need to fucking resurrect that? Like, literally, it's flogging a dead horse, you know? Um, I, I just think Pun that intended. They, exactly. They should just have a, a, like, call it London Rugby League Club. You know, find a stadium that works, stick with it, one that's that's got good facilities, that is up to standard, not some fucking local ground, which they keep going for because it, it saves money. And try and build something and strike while the iron's hot. Because it's not much to run a Super League club. 
Hmm. So now it comes down to which which club then would be able to make the most out of that. Because, I mean, it'd be great to have an NRL club running, not just A, let's say, let's say, why not have a few NRL clubs running a few Super League teams? Like a joint venture between, say, and I'm just I'm just saying clubs here, Penrith and Parramatta, do a joint venture. Well, could, well, I was thinking more along the lines of just one club, and just, they could have them as feeder clubs between the mm-hmm. two. So, mm-hmm. you know, Penrith could could have, say, London. West Tigers could have, you know, what's someone fittingly? Wakefield. <laughs> you wouldn't drag I, I, Wakefield down like that? <laughs> actually, no. They, they, Wakefield should be with the Dragons. <laughs> yeah. Because the West Tigers can go, because the West Tigers are second last. They can mm-hmm. be with Castleford. They're both Tigers. They're both second last. Oh, that works out all right. Perfect. I wonder if you went to the owner of Wakefield and you said, we will give you £500,000 to move to London. I wonder what they would say. I think they'd say no. But if you went to them and said, we'll give you £500,000 to go to London and we will make sure that you are never relegated for the next 10 years, they would say yes. And and this is what I'm talking about. Because that's the thing. If, they, if they've got... Absolute confirmation they're not going to get relegated. Yeah. That gives them 10 years to build the squad they want and no threat whatsoever that they're going down. So they can get in place all their structures and finances and get the squad and their juniors and everything lined up perfectly. So by the time that 10 years is coming around, they should be in a position to be one of the strongest teams in the competition because they've not had to worry about going down, losing finances, any of that sort of stuff. They're set. Yeah. And that would be, and that's the thing. You do that once for one club, every other club's going to go, we want that. And then boom, you've got rid of that stupid fucking outdated bullshit system that does nothing but cost clubs and the game money. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I understand that Wakefield fans wouldn't like it, right? I really do. I understand that. And Wakefield is actually one of the areas in, uh, and, and Castleford is like it too, where juniors come through those clubs and they end up getting bought by other clubs, unfortunately. So these are areas that that it is important to have representation in those areas. But those juniors would come through Castleford after that point. How many fans are you losing from Wakefield? Um, but how many could you gain in London? And, and you're not. It's not even as though you're having to expand the competition. You're just moving one club and. Look, if I was the owner of Wakefield, not they they're in a real bad position this year. They've picked the worst year to tank that they possibly could have. Um, you know, if if I if a package like that was put to me, I would have to really consider it because it's a lifeline at this stage because they they're out the back door as well as it's looking right now. Oh yeah, they they are not in a good spot at all. Look at the moment. Um, their average crowd is just on 4,000, mm-hmm. which is just, mm, that's atrocious for Super League. Yeah. Um, the London it, Broncos, look, who aren't even in the top what? eight at the moment, they're averaging, you know, just over 1,000 for their home games this year. And they're not even been, I mean, they've had eight wins and 18 losses. No, that was last year, sorry. They're not much better this year, though. They're still sitting about a similar position, but they're averaging 1,037 a game. And I would suggest that the Broncos are probably playing at a better stadium than Wakefield are right now. Like, are they that Trail Finders one now? Trail Finders. Yeah, was that the ground they were playing at? The ground they were playing at? The Wakefield ground? No, um, London. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Like they move, they've moved so many grounds over the years. I just lost track of it. <laughs> That's like Cherry Red Record Stadium. Is it that one? They've got a lot of... I'm just... I'm finally looking it up here now. I, I can't make out what their fucking home ground is. That's so rugby league. <laughs> yeah, I think it's that cherry red one. So it was Plough Lane. You shush. <laughs> no one asked you. Um, yeah, they played at Plough Lane. I feel like at one point they were talking about playing at the Olympic Stadium once it was redeveloped. Oh, 
And that was a crazy idea. Like, I understand it would be a state-of-the-art facility compared to what they're probably looking at, but the, the atmosphere would have been shocking. Yeah. It'd be like taking a um a 2022 West Tigers game at the end of the season to the original, you know, Stadium Australia when it could hold 120,000 people. Yeah, yeah. And you put 300 people in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, this is my bay. <laughs> it's, yeah. They, they don't have seat numbers. They just have bay numbers. Yeah. I think you've um, got bay 12. <laughs> it, it's... It's an interesting, it's an interesting situation though, and like on top of that, uh, rugby union in Wales is in a really, really bad state as well. Like the club competition is, there's so many places where, in Britain, where the club competition for rugby union is just in a real fucked state. I wonder how much is that due to the fact that during COVID, they enforced for the first time a salary cap over there to try and make sure that um, I dare say to make sure that there was enough money to make sure everyone was being paid and, you know, finances were secure and stuff like that. I dare say there was a, a justified reason behind it. So the players didn't get fucked over from, but from I, what I, sorry, go on. I was going to say, but I wonder if that turned some potential buyers away because they would have seen it evening up the competition a little bit and they, you know, a buyer wants to come into a club that they know is going to be successful. From, from what I've gathered and, and everything that I've read, it's basically the outcome that has happened from um, not coming to terms with uh, professionalism. And it's, so in rugby union, the first thing, the the people that got the power in rugby union when they turned professional, they only turned professional because of the Super League war in rugby league. Uh Um, When they turned professional, the power outcome was that it went to the national sides. So, England, the England team and the Australian team and the New Zealand team, they were the power holders. Correct. And over in Europe, that they, that didn't change, but the clubs started to gain some momentum and they started to build crowds and, and things like that and get, get uh, big sponsors on board and things like that. And they just overspent and they kept on kicking the can down the road. And they were building up debts, building up debts, building up debts. And it's just got to a point where it's the debt is too big. Mm. That's what my understanding of the situation is. Where the other thing is they're trying to compete financially with French clubs that are in a, a better financial situation. Oh, they, are, they are phenomenally strong. Yeah, and they, they just can't compete with them. But they're spending, as, they're spending money they just don't have is what yeah. it comes down to. Um, That's the thing that and, they've probably had to take out assurities to ensure that the players are genuinely getting paid, so that the players will still keep coming. Because as soon as, as soon as word gets out that players aren't getting paid, they won't go there anymore. Because they go, mm-hmm, we we need our money. Yeah. And that's it doesn't matter what sport you play. Yeah, yeah. The players need to be paid. Yeah. You can't have a situation where the club just does whatever the fuck they want with them because. That's a dick move. So, but, yeah, club, players from any code will not go to any team within that code if they know that there's a chance or a risk that they won't be getting any of the money. Yeah, and that's why salary caps are important because mm. it, it reigns in spending and it, you know, it, it keeps everything viable. And it took, it's taken a long time for Super League clubs to – realize that that's what the salary cap's for and i think that they're finally at a point where they are ex- they're finally accepting of the salary cap i don't think that they're all under the salary cap by any stretch of the imagination but no well, they haven't really structured their salary cap to be you know as strict as the one we've got here and yeah ours is the strictest one probably in world sport and it's still not insanely strict but it's yeah. it's at least stronger than most others that's a lot easier to manage um yeah the english one is i mean it's as you said it's it's starting to show some results we're starting to see um some of the teams that were consistently you know the top six seven sides in super league you know when they struggle start seeing them drop a fair way down and, and more importantly we're we've stopped seeing as many super league clubs anyway go fucking broke or out of nowhere that's the main thing. 
Yeah. Even even championship sides. We're not seeing those those ones going broke either. Yeah, it's been it's been a little while, hasn't it? Um, yeah. But the and the thing about rugby union over there and anywhere really is there's only so many test jerseys that are available in terms of where you're making your money. Um, and then you've got a lot of players that they make their money at just purely at club level. If them jobs are all gone, where do they make their money? Now, they can obviously go overseas. There will be a lot of them will go to France and, you know, wherever else they can. But there's only so many of them will leave and there'll be players that will be come through and like juniors and things like that would, that will be looking for an outlet to play the sport. And I, I just think that there's a chance there for rugby league. And I, you know, I I do. I think it needs to be subtle and well thought out. And IMG should be looking at it as an opportunity, not to overcapitalize on the the moment. But there's something there that I think can be done. And I could see where in five years' time we kind of look back and we say, you know what? Remember that time that the English Rugby Union competition contracted and Super League expanded by a couple of clubs and now they've got a much bigger footprint across the, the you know, England. Um, I actually wonder what would happen if the... Because they've got a... They've got a Newcastle team. Is there one in Northampton? They've, they've I mean, that's them. the only... That's the closest they've got to another Northern team, I guess. Oh, they're in Rugby Union? Yeah. They've got... I think they've still got the Sale Sharks. Oh yeah, um, so. And they've got the I don't know what what level the Leeds Tykes play at. No, they're, they're not in the top division. Yeah, yeah. So, but there's been talk about them merging with the Newcastle Falcons rugby union team, which is, I mean, that's a desperation move. That's the thing that gets me about. What if what if their teams that are north of London? Yeah. Were to fold or merge or disappear. Yeah. And we end up having, as we did back in 1895, League in the North, Union in the South. It's po- it's possible. But that's where I'm st- I'm thinking like... If I think if it have... got to that point, Union mm. would, would struggle worse because League's always just been a Northern game. Whereas Union has, had, has relied on its move around the rest of the country. But if they start going back to being south only, yeah, I think it would hurt them more. It would, it, and that opens the possibility of like if league can then establish its presence in the south as well, then that's a real problem for rugby union. What would be There's a major place talk- for them to go to in the south other than London? Is there some somewhere else? Yeah, <sighs> a, a legit place they could go to in the south. Hmm. Other than London, that they could go to. But considering that they're going, they've already got two teams in London. Yeah. What's a team we could put in the south somewhere to try and put a bigger footprint down there? And where would you put them? It's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Bath. And the only reason I suggest them is because their rugby union team has been strong for a long time. Mm. So it's basically a rugby union area. But then you're taking that team on head on. That's right. And Bath's not a huge area. Yeah. Whereas you've got, you've got areas right now where they had a rugby union team and now they don't. Like, if you wanted to start up a team, you could put it in the same area. But then you... you it worries me because then you've got to try and avoid what happened to the rugby union team, you know what I mean? That's right, yeah. So maybe it's got to be something along the lines of just taking games down there but not teams. Well, that's what I think I would do. You know, take take games on the road. I I suggested that. I had somebody on Twitter say it didn't work in, like, I think they said 1997. So why would it work now? And I had to point out that was 25 years ago. Um, I think you could make it work. But it would need to be an, it'd need to be the head office doing that and going to clubs and saying, look, uh, it'd, it'd have to be from next year because you've already sold your season tickets for this year. Yeah. We want to do this. We want to allocate, you know, certain home matches that you have down to the south of England 
to try and achieve this goal. How about Magic Weekend at, say, Southampton? Well, that's what I think. I think you take Magic Weekend down there, you know, put the, put a, take the show on the road, put it down there. and Because um, I don't think the Challenge Cup resonates like it used to in the South. Oh, God, no, no. And thing, they, you could you could probably have two. There's, there's no reason why you couldn't have two magic rounds or split magic round across two cities. But you could have like say, um, just trying to think of two areas that are closest in England. Say Southampton and Bournemouth. Mm-hmm. Have Saturday games at Southampton, Sunday games at Bournemouth. Yeah, you, you know, could do that. You can try and spread them out a little bit. Um, maybe go across to. Um, Maybe like Bristol and Cardiff. I know there's a big slab of water in the middle there, but you know you could put them. They're kind of close. There's a, there's a few bridges there. I'm sure. I'm sure someone's got a a raft in Cardiff. They could just toss across a road, and you can come across on that. Um, <laughs> you go down Exeter, Plymouth. Uh, what else is down there? So there's not much down there, but you could do something like that and just sort of play the magic round across two cities. Hmm. and try and spread it out a little bit. And that way you're getting more communities getting exposed to it. And you bring in the whole, yeah, you're promoting the whole magic round thing. So it's an all year round thing that you're you're doing and and talking it up. So it gets people the opportunity to get excited about it. Got all these people from the North coming down for a bit of a, you know, weekend holiday sort of thing. They don't have to fly. I know half of them probably will want to because it's it's a fucking long way down the road. See, the, the thing, I kind of wonder if a Nines tournament would be the best way to go and play in winter because Rugby Union over there has played in winter, right? The only, the only problem I've got with Nines mm-hmm. is the results don't matter. And I think when it comes to having actual Super League rounds where the, the games matter means you're taking that town, you're taking it too seriously. You're going, these games are important. Whereas you take a noise and you're going, yeah, this is just some tinky shit we're doing here. Yeah, I get that. I think that's, I think nines and stuff works in heartland areas when you want to get a reason to get more fans into the game in your heartland areas. When you go into a new area, you want to take games there that are meaningful Mm -hmm. so that the town you're taking it to knows that you're being genuine and serious about it. That's my view anyway. No, no, I, I get that completely. The other thing is too, you've got to play internationals in London again. Um, it's, Absolutely. It's, it is crazy that, like, the big crowd used to be the London match. Yeah. That, you know, and now it's like they won't even go there. It's nuts. It, and they shoot themselves in the arm because of the amount of potential revenue they could be making out of that. Yeah. But it all has to be backed up with here's our event and here's the club to follow if you want to become a rugby league fan. And, yes, it's involved in the big league. You know what I mean? Yeah. It it can't be a it can't be a let's try and do an event and then leave and never come back, which is a lot of what rugby league has done in the past in different areas. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's been it's been crazy. Um, you know, they probably had an opportunity during the last World Cup to take a you know a few games out around these these uh, southern areas. Wouldn't yeah, be I a think, bad idea. I think they took how many? I think they maybe only took one. Was it? Yeah. They had the one Australia versus Scotland, which was a fantastic game to watch. Um, but that was it. Yeah, and that was a completely missed opportunity. No, you're 100%. When you look back at it now and you realise the state that Rugby Union was in last winter for them. Yeah. And they took one game to the south. Like, fuck. It was ridiculous. But the worst thing about it too, okay, is obviously they're charging a lot of money, but they're charging a lot of money for tickets to the people who have been propping up Super League, the championship, the league one for mm-hmm. decades. Mm-hmm. And you're going, give us some more money now. Like, no, 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 no. How's about you still let them have the semifinals and stuff there because they deserve it. Yes. You don't charge them more for that. You charge them the same as a pool game for those ones. Charge more for the final. That's understandable. But take a lot of more games down to new markets and have new people whose pockets you haven't picked before. Mm. You get your hands into those ones. That's what that's what expansion's about. That's what you know tours were about. You go to new areas. 
you spread the word, you spread the game, you, spread, you, know, you get extra dollars into it. That's what you do. You don't keep picking the same pocket all the time. Eventually that pocket gets dry. Exactly. Um, the other thing is too, like if if the World Cup final last year had it been in Wembley, that would have been awesome. Oh, absolutely. Um, I can understand having it in the north. I really can. And, and no, I wouldn't I'm, even argue either way, but, man, it would have been cool if it was in Wembley. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason why they couldn't have had the two semifinals in the north. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they're your final four big-name teams. Absolutely have them in the north, but the final needs to be at Wembley. Every big game needs to be at Wembley. The grand final, the, the, the Challenge Cup, any test matches, you've got to have one of them has got to be at Wembley. You've got to start using that thing more. Yeah, it's cr- it's just so insane when you think about, like, where the game was just a couple of decades ago in terms yeah. of – and now it's terrified to go there for some reason. You know what? The Broncos should play their first game every year there. That would be cool. Just say, you know what? This is your rugby league team. And when they're going there and they're taking a test match there, did you know there's a team that plays out, plays out around London here every week? It's called the London Broncos. And if you can't get to those ones, there's another one. The London Scholars, they're around here too. Yeah. We're giving you shit tons of rugby league. You love it? Come check them out. There's two of them here. Fucking promote those games while you're there, those teams. That's what they've got to be doing. And they're just, there's just nothing. Will you just be quiet? <laughs> I know you're here. I know you exist. You don't need to keep reminding me. I'm trying to forget that. All right? <laughs> uh, there's too many blunt objects in here for me to throw at you. That cat, that cat would fuck you up. Yeah. A, you know what we a, should do as a podcast a one contest day? We should do a podcast one day where you take your cat and you give it a bath. Yeah, I I remember doing that the first time. <laughs> we ran out of band aids, and I'm not bullshitting you. So I've I've learned there's a method, and that is in our shower. You got one of those, um, you know, the shower heads that are on the the hose that you can just take off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you shuck the cat into the shower, you shut the door, and then you get the cord to hang down underneath the tap and then you just pull the tap handle up and you're just washing the cat from up above. It can't get at you because it's behind a glass wall. That's the only way you can wash this cat. I've only ever done it like that once because it was just uh, too much of a pest. A horror show, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that was only because the cat went bloody wandering around underneath someone's car outside and got covered in bloody oil. Oh, man, that if I hadn't was washed it, it would have tried to lick it off and killed itself. So, you know, yeah. for some reason, I kept you alive. <laughs> it's just won't fit a dice hurt, can eat you? Basically. Um, basically. Is, would there be a bigger, more expensive money spinner in all of rugby league's history than playing a state of origin at Wembley? It'd be pretty cool, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, like, I'm trying to think of how it would work for time. So, uh, you'd have a daytime kickoff. Yeah, it'd be daytime. Imagine playing that in the daylight. Yeah, that'd be the thing. In the English summer when it'd be, uh, you know, insanely high temperature of like 23 or something. So, our 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 8 p.m. would be like their 11 a.m. in the morning. It'd probably it'd probably have to be a Sunday game, which is fine. Uh, I th- I think that the crowd would be fucking enormous, and yeah. you've got the lead in to it, so that uh, I'm trying to think of how you would be. Well, with it being Sunday, if you didn't have any NRL games until the Friday, you'd be you'd be all right coming back. Um, if you're left on the Monday, you know what I do too, and this is this is sound weird because of the the time you do it, uh, yeah. like the timing of it, yeah. I'd have the state of origin on. Yeah. You say to everyone, hang around because the London Broncos are up next. You wouldn't put it on before? No, because you, I mean, you're looking at like a 9 a.m. kickoff. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good so point. So I'd, I'd have it on afterwards. I think that. I know it sounds, as I said, I know it sounds crazy. You're pretty much saying, you know, state of origin's the, the undercard. Mm. But, you know, we're not trying to push the London Broncos game over in Australia. That's just for the English audience. Yeah. Give it, Give that to them at a normal time. You know, what you could do, because it has nothing to do with the English rugby league, right? So you could have 
State of Origin, and then you could have like two Super League games on after it. Oh, imagine putting that on Magic Round. Oh. So you could have State of Origin on and then say three three, um, Super League games on, and then the next day you have, what, five Super League games. Or you could spread it out and just have three, three, and two or something like that. Yeah, that'd be crazy. Like, how, like, State of Origin and two Super League games and then have three, three Super League games the day after and three the day after that. So I think that the, the State of Origin game would have to be on Sunday though for it to work. Because, because they'd still want it to work for our TV audience. So it'd have to kick off at 8 p.m., which it could. Yep. Yep. Um, and yeah, have the State of Origin kick off 11 a.m. and then have like the following Super League games and it'd all be part of Magic Round. That'd be one of the biggest rugby league events ever. I would say. Hell yeah. That'd be crazy. That would be crazy good. And you'd have you'd have that in London. Fuck yes. Damn. And everybody would want like everyone from the north would want to go to it. And you would get a lot of people in London that would want to go to that. Mm-hmm. Man, that would be absolutely fucking epic. Yep. And the NRL could just say, you know what? We just want the money that the London you know government will pay us to have this game here and try and help the English game out and say, you know what, whatever gate takings we help you get, you're welcome to them. So long as we get our money, and the London government's going to pass a fuck ton to have one game there. We don't need to be that gritty where we say we want all the fucking gate tickets and shit like that. It's just, yeah. You know what, RFL, you have them. You know what? But we can put a proviso on there. We want to see this done with that money. That would be cool. Imagine if that money was put into a fund to fund uh, an expansion club in London. Mm. And it wouldn't yeah. take long to build that up to a good good amount of money. No, if you did that every couple of years, you'd probably fund it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, it would be insane. It it makes – look, that makes more sense than taking NRL games to fucking Las Vegas, which I don't know what that's all about. It's just silly. Um, I wouldn't be surprised and if that's got a lot more to do with Peter Volandi's horse racing shit more than anything else because I'm, for a long time, gambling was an issue as to how they would, how you could do it in America in a lot of places. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of states had different laws on it and how it was all done. And I think that's been opened up an awful lot in the last few years. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's part of what it is. It's interesting you say that because I've been thinking the exact same thing, that it's not about rugby league. It's about opening doors for his other gambling interests. He's yep. still ahead of racing New South Wales. That's right. I think it's got more to do with, um, you know, betting rights and all that sort of mm-hmm. shit and whatever else for, for horse racing in America to be in, you know, be gambled on Australia and vice versa, especially yeah. vice versa. Yeah. The other thing is, too, that uh, there's a very, 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 very long history of U.S. sports looking to do deals in Las Vegas for that to be their cash cow and then failing fucking miserably. Mm-hmm. Um, and all sorts of sports. So yeah. um, it's kind of like the Gold Coast, isn't it? It, it is, yeah. Well, it's a, it's an interesting place because it's almost a city that is, it's almost a city that's divided because you've got the the tourist part of it, and then you've got the people that live there. And the people that live there, if you're trying to target them for an event, good luck, because they get sound and noise and lights about events every fucking day. They're jaded. That's a yeah. jaded audience. Yeah. You've got to do something fucking impressive to get them to go, oh, yeah, I might go and watch that. Maybe we could get someone to go around and just, uh, I wouldn't say get touchy-feely, maybe just slap a few people around. You want to go? You want to fucking go? Come watch me this weekend, eh? Just threaten them. So you're down the football park, <laughs> you or me. Just do something. I mean, that'll get their attention, won't it? It's, 
I bet it's more than the fucking NRL will do to will do to promote whatever they're <laughs> fucking doing over there. It's so silly. Hey, I, I I heard, and I hope our large South Australian audience can back this up or, or correct me if I'm wrong. That we were putting, we had adver- advertisement up for State of Origin in South Australia saying, "Come and watch real football." That is true. You're going, uh, yeah, because that's an AFL loving state. That's how you get them on side. Hey, guess what? Your sport's shit. Come watch ours. It's better. That'll yeah. really work. I, I've had that confirmed to me by Julie. We've oh, talked about God. this. And Who um, thinks of that? Yeah. Well, that's what I mean about with with rugby league in London. If it does try and target those disaffected rugby union fans, you can't go in and say everything you've done is shit and you need to be following this because that doesn't work. You just put them offside. Um, but yeah, that. Whoever come up with that idea is a fucking idiot, hey? Like, I couldn't believe what I heard. I went, no, 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 no. That surely didn't happen. I went, more thought about it, I went, yeah. PBL's been shitting on AFL for a while. That kind of makes sense. It's probably come from, it's probably his idea. Probably come from him, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, uh, man, I, I reckon we solved all of that, hey? Absolutely. I, it'd make Stop. so much money. There'd be so much money. Mm. That'd be a real shot in the arm for Super League too. Massive, absolutely. It'd be, it'd be, you know, you're taking this. Oh, by the way, that reminds me. Yeah. <laughs> did you, did you see the fucking Pommy Journo that was winching about State of Origin? You had, no, you know how there's these weird people that State of Origin rolls around and they all watch the game. But they complain about it and they're like, fucking Australians, they should be doing this with the International Rugby League, blah, blah, blah. Well, um, there was this fucking Pommy Journo that works for the BBC and, uh, he was, he was trying to make a point. He said he was trying to make a point that he made poorly, but he was basically saying, oh, it's a regional competition that no one cares about and it's dying or something like that. State and of origin it, is? Yes. Yes. Right. It, Probably the biggest money spurt, uh, money turning rugby product on planet Earth. He's I'd like about. to know how much money State of Origin makes compared to Super League. Oh, and then say, you know what, let's divide that between the number of games that they both played. What's that, three games versus how many hundred? Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I would bet that just the three games makes more than the entire Super League competition. Like, I'd like to know how many rounds of football it would take for Super League to draw as many <laughs> people in attendance as it does for Origin to get for three games. Well, well, he was talking about, like, they, the Australians don't take the game anywhere. It's like, the fucking game's in Adelaide. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? And there's a sellout crowd there. Um, Not to mention, I mean, we've got a team from New Zealand that's in the NRL and has been for years. Yeah, and, and the fact that all of the fucking elite international players are developed by NRL clubs. Um, there is that, too. But I, f- I found that interesting, and a lot of people jumped on him, and, it, it, like, he tried to talk his way out of it, but it, it was funny to see people just go crazy at him, like, what are you talking about? And then um, I had another half discussion on Twitter today with some people. That I saw some people saying that they thought that the – you'll love this one. The Rugby League Players Association should be funding Rugby League in New Zealand and International Rugby League. Why? Because it's in the spirit of the game. It's it's a players <laughs> union. Yeah, but they've got a responsibility to fund the New Zealand Rugby League. Fund what? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's what I said. Like they're not a governing body for a sport. Yeah, I they're said, a union. <laughs> yes, I said it's it's a workers' union. But the the responsibility of funding rugby league in New Zealand is on the New Zealand rugby league. And the, the, you know, what happens with international rugby league is on the international rugby league. They weren't getting it. That's nuts. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. Um, next time someone says to you too, as I was thinking about this for a while, when you mentioned that, that, you know, the NRL doesn't take rugby league anywhere. Just say to them, did you know that from the um, the northernmost part of Great Britain, so mm-hmm. in Scotland or wherever, mm-hmm. to the southernmost part of England, mm-hmm. 
That is the same distance from Darwin to Alice Springs. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Which is further. Oh, sorry. That's less than the Cowboys and their next closest team. Yeah. By quite a lot. By actually, that's half the distance. Darwin to Alice Springs. It's half yeah. the distance. I remember years ago when I used to waste my time talking to people on English rugby league websites. And it was like, I don't say that disparaging to them. Yes, I do. Um, And I would say like, I don't go to all the Panthers games and they'd be like, you don't go to away games. And I'd be like, no, they'd be like, well, how can you call yourself a real fan? It's like, do you know how fucking far distances are in Australia? And a lot of them couldn't wrap their head around how far it was between, no, like, say, Penrith and North Queensland. They don't. They it's don't get it. Crazy, yeah. Um, but yeah, we've talked about a lot today. It's been good. We've got it all covered. Yeah, yeah. And at that point, we should probably wrap it up so we don't uh, take up people's entire mornings when they listen to it. True. So, um, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Make sure you check us out on the socials on um, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. There's some other ones. You know I'm all by now. Uh, check them all. Check us out on all of those. Share us around on the socials too. That'd be sweet. And um, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you all next time.